church, everybody. If y'all could, let's all stand to our feet. We're going to start the morning off with come what may. Sometimes sorrow is the door to peace. Sometimes heartache is the gift I need. Yes, it is. You're faithful, faithful in all things. In every high, in every low, on mountain tops, down broken roads, you're still my rock. My home remains, I'll rest in the arms of Jesus, come what may. Come what may. There is deep joy that you give to me. Where hurt meets the healing is a holy thing I see goodness your goodness in all things oh, in every high in every low on mountain tops down broken roads you're still my rock my home remains I'll rest in the arms of Jesus Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. The Lord is my shepherd, leads me to still waters, and he restores my soul. out and talking about his shepherd. And then David knows that growing deeper in relationship means realizing that I am a sheep and he is my leader, he is my shepherd. And so growing deeper in relationship with God is growing deeper in relationship with the one who is in control of me, who I am surrendered to. But it also means that I am in relationship with the sheep around me, that there is something protective and, and necessary about being around the rest of the sheep and so growing deeper in relationship with God and growing deeper in relationship with those around him is what David's pleading for us to sing this bridge one more time but I want you to know that this whole year for us all of this year we're going to be talking about growing deeper because in my heart in the heart of Chad the staff everybody that serves here we just want to create a place where like David's heart we're growing deeper in relationship with our Father and in relationship with each other and so kicking it off. So as we sing this, sing it with all you got. It's all about growing deep. Right, let's sing it together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Oh, the Lord is my shepherd, leads me to still waters, and he restores my soul. In every high, in every low, on mountain tops, down broken roads, you're still my rock. My home remains, I'll rest in the arms of Jesus. In every high, in every low, on mountain tops, down broken roads, you'll steal my rock. My home remains, I'll rest in the arms of Jesus. Come one more. Amen. Hey, man. Hey.
say, come whatever. I hope that we as Bainbridge Church will stand in God's word. Never leave him nor forsake him because he's never going to leave or forsake us. Amen. Listen, we serve a good God. And this year, as you can tell, I mean, growing deeper is the focal point from Sunday service to Woomba Land and our kids to to youth across the street. Um, And I I just have a feeling uh, that God's going to be good to us this year because he's been so faithful to me. Listen, for my whole life, man, I don't know about you guys, but I was as lost for, for my ex my ex used to say this. I was as lost as a weenie dog in tall grass. You hear me? Listen, I was out living my life for just me and me alone. And God shook me, found me and saved me right where I was. And um, he's been, he's been good and faithful to me. And so this song is called goodness of God. Last time we did it, uh, y'all sang it louder than I did. Praise God for that. Um, this song is called goodness of God. Y'all sing it with me. Okay. fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God yes I will and oh my you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest nights You are close like no other I've known you as a father Yes, I have I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God Let's sing that chorus all my life all oh, my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me, yes it is. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Let's sing it again, your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will 
we'll see of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to see. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am of the goodness of God Oh, I'm gonna see of the goodness of God Oh, I'm gonna see Woo, of His goodness, amen I don't know where um you're at uh, right now, except for like physically, I see you. I don't know what you've been going through this week. Um, I don't know if uh, you're in one of those seasons where kind of like darkness is all around. Has anybody ever been in a season like that in their life? Whew, man, it seems like the older I get, the more common they are. <laughs> I don't know why that is. Uh, but in scripture, um, there's, a, there's, there's a person who basically is being um, controlled by an evil spirit. Scripture says that he has demons like in him. And when Jesus walks up, the demons inside of him realized exactly who that man was. And that it wasn't just a man named Jesus. It was the Son of God. Listen, and the demons, it says that, that they trembled at the very mention of the name of, of Jesus. Transfer that. How does that transfer to our lives? When is the last time that you called on the powerful and strong name of Jesus into a darkness in your life? When's the last time? Listen, there could be an addiction that's got you weighed down. It could be some type of relationship. It could be stuff that you're looking at um, with your eyes that's got, a, that's got a hold on you. It could be a judgmental attitude where you always find fault in others, but really nothing in yourself. I get that too. Whatever it is, maybe somebody's doing something to you if you're a young person, maybe. Whatever the darkness is, no matter how big or how small you think it is, it cannot, that darkness cannot be around if you call on the name of, of Jesus. Darkness just can't be around light. So this song is called Tremble. Listen to me. If the demons tremble at the very thought of Christ, what would all of those darknesses in our lives, what would happen to them if we called on the name of Jesus and give it to him? The song's called Trim. Jesus, Jesus, you make the 
would touch a heart in this room this morning. Be with us during the next portion of the service. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I hope so. So um, uh, if you didn't get a binder, you need one. Okay, so we're going to be in the study of the book of Romans. We've never done this before, by the way. 
But we're going to be in the book of Romans for like 36 weeks. And so my goal really is to just um, share the word with you, but, but then primarily um, not to bore you. Because um, uh, I, I know we all have short attention spans. And 36 weeks is a long time, 34, 36 weeks, however long it's going to take. But we got this, and, and we want you to use this. If you have one, great. If you didn't get one, get one. But we only have enough to give everybody one. So if you lose it or forget it, you can't get a new one every week. Just try not to forget your, your binder. And then every week as you come in, there's going to be a new sheet you can slide in there that's going to be ready for today. And so you should have week two in there ready to go as we jump in. By the way, put your, your name and stuff on the outside. That way, if you accidentally leave it, we can call you and get it back to you, because as it, as with any gift, it's it's free to you, but it wasn't free, so we want to get it back to you if you leave it. All right, um, we we decided at the beginning of this year to to prayerfully consider what it is God wants us to do as a church, and we settled on the this this idea of growing deeper. That, it, that all this whole year is going to be about growing deeper, growing deeper. And our mission, if you don't know, our mission statement for our church is and has always been to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And so part of that is not only growing in relationship with God, but growing in relationship with each other. That's what a church is designed and supposed to do. You're created for community to grow in relationship with each other. And so this year is all about that. And so this idea of going through an entire book of the Bible, especially the book of Romans, is designed to facilitate the growing deeper with God part by studying his word. And so today we're jumping into that. Now, typically, my style of preaching is expository exegetical, okay? And those are just theological fancy words for meaning verse by verse, taking the words in the context in which they were written, that's exegetical. And then expository means exposing it to us so that we know how to apply it to our lives today, exegetical expository preaching. Well, today we're going to be talking about verses where you can't really do that because this is Paul writing to the church at Rome that he never got a chance to visit. And he's spilling out his heart for how he feels about them. And so I want to read it in its entirety first, and then we'll go back and look at it piece by piece. And what you're going to notice is this sermon today is all about the prayers of a pastor. So just read along with me. It's on the top of your page there. I'm going to read it from here. We're just going to read all the way through, and then we'll go back. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for, all, for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit and the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. Always in my prayers, making requests, if perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may finally succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Now, we're going to kind of tackle those one at a time. Here's a little um, trick of the trade. If you're trying to fill out the fill in the blanks or whatever, if it's underlined up here, it's probably in your binder, and you can go ahead and fill that in as we approach. So let's go ahead and look at verse 1. So verse 1 says this, first, first, First thing Paul does, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. What he's saying is, the first thing I think about is praying for you. That's the first thing I do. Now, I will confess to you, that is not my first thing, okay? I, I don't pray first, and this eats me up, and I try. I set alarms on my phone, I get, and the first thing I want to do is pray, and I'm working on it. I really am. I'm working on it. I'm doing it more often than I have ever in my, in my, in my life, okay? But I'm working on it. I am the guy that does first and then say, hey, Jesus, could you come in on this, this deal that I've already began without asking you permission to even start? That's kind of how I do things, which is not good, okay? But I'm, I'm working on it. But Paul says the first thing I do, the first thing, and before we start this letter, 16 chapters of truth, I want you to know the first thing is I thank God for you. And at the end of today's message, I'm going to tell you some of the things I am thankful for for you. Then he, so this is your first fill in the blank. He starts with prayer. He starts with prayer. And I love that about Paul. He starts, he starts, he starts with prayer. Okay, verse, go back. We're going to go back to that verse again. And I want to show you the, the, the ending part of it. Because your faith is being proclaimed through the whole world. 
He said, I'm going to thank God because your faith, everyone is seeing and everyone knows about it. You have a reputation. You have a reputation in our known world for the kind of things that you're doing among people. And I don't know if you know this, but I'll go ahead and tell you the reputation of the church in Rome was that of, you can go to the next slide, please. The church was known for healing and protecting people. It was known for healing and protecting people. Now, th this is not just in the scripture, though you can find it there. But there are actually men and women who lived during this time, during the 40s, the 50s, and 60s AD, when the church had just began. And they wrote down some of the things that the church did. Here's a for instance. You can read this in Tacitus. You can read this in Josephus. You can find these ancient writings that are not in the Bible, but talk about how Christians did things. Here's one thing that they would do. When a plague would come through a town, and what would usually happen is it would be in your home, right? And somebody would get sick. And so what do you do? You put them in a room, you quarantine them, and then you leave. And then you hope when you come back after the plague's gone that they're still alive. But you don't stick around long enough because you don't know if it's going to get on you. And so what would happen is a plague would come through a city, people would take off, and the Christians would go into the town and start finding these people that are broken and hurting and diseased, and they would bring them out and they would care for them and, and take care of them until they were well again. Or if they didn't get well, they made sure that they were buried with dignity and honored. That's what the church did from the very outset. Here's another thing. I don't know if you know, but in the first century, it was very common for people, if you had a kid that was disfigured, or if you had one that was a gender that you didn't want, you could take it and put it somewhere out in the, in the elements, and it would die of exposure over time, and it was considered common. And the Christians knew that there were certain places that people would do this, and so they would wait, and whenever a baby got dropped off, they would swoop in and grab that baby and take it home and raise it as their own. That's what the church did. And, and Paul's saying to them, you are known. For being a healing and a protecting people. Your faith is known throughout this area. It is your reputation precedes you because of how you treat people. Now I want to talk about, and like I said, this isn't like expository, you know, exegetical preaching. This is me just pouring my heart out to you. So let's talk about our reputation, Bainbridge Church's reputation. I called a few people and I said, hey, well, what do people say about us? Like, what's the word on the street? And it's changed over the years, if you don't know. Okay, so when we started eight years ago, um, the common word was that we were kind of a cult because we were weird. We, did, you know, we, we, we showed the preacher on a TV screen, and people were like, why are you showing the preacher on TV screen? And then, you know, we played songs that, like, why are you singing that in church? And people didn't really understand because they didn't come and give us a chance. But so we had, we had names like that. But our reputation lately, as I, as I ask around, we, we have a reputation of healing, of no judgment, and high expectations. What I mean by that? We have, a, we, have a, we have a reputation of healing in that people know if you've been hurt by another church, if someone said something, if another church hurt you, if you were condemned or you felt like you couldn't go to that church anymore, people in our area know you can come here and you can, you can be healed and you can be fed and you can be loved on. They know that when you come in this room, it's dark. Why is it dark? Because we want you to feel like you can come in and sit down and no one's going to bug you. You can just come in and receive healing and hope. You can worship the way you want to worship. That's why it's dark during worship. You want to raise your hands. You want to sing loud. You want to get down on your face. If you want whatever you want to do, we want everyone to feel comfortable to experience the healing of God's grace in this place. Now, we hope you stick around after restoration comes. Sometimes what happens is people get that restoration and that healing and then they go back to the church that hurt them. And they go back with forgiveness in their heart. And they go back with love in their heart. And they repair relationships, which is beautiful. And, and, and that, that's cool. We, we, want, we want that to happen. But we're known as a church that can, you can do that. You can, this is a safe space for you to receive healing from whatever has happened to you. Another thing we're kind of known for is this is a no-judge environment. There is no judgment here. Because if anyone's going to pronounce judgment, take this microphone off my face and fire me. Because I've got no business standing up here in front of you if we're talking about labeling anybody's sin and where, who, who stands in what place before God. This is a no judgment zone. You can come committing the most atrocious sin anyone's ever heard of in their life and you are welcome to sit in this place and you are welcome to worship and you are welcome to be a part of what we're doing every single week. No judgment. That's not our job. I, I don't get paid enough and nobody in this room has lived well enough to judge another human being on this planet ever, ever. That's not our position. It is the position of the Holy Spirit and God himself to do that work. It's not mine. And so this is a place where you can come no matter what you're in the middle of. And you can feel loved and accepted. And when the government tells us, we'll hug you again. That, I shouldn't have said that. That was weird. Listen. The bottom line is we love you. I love you. There is nothing you can do that will make anybody in this church love you less. 
There is nothing you can do that will make your God love you less. He loves you perfectly in the middle of all the filth and the, and the condemnation. He loves you. And we're going to do everything we can to, to help you feel that kind of love in this place. There's no judgment. Thirdly, high expectations. Now, this part, this part I, I, I am not ashamed to say. Once you decide to cross the step of faith and then say, you know what? Put me in coach. Once you decide to get involved in the Jesus stuff, once you decide to start serving in one of our environments, then there will be someone having conversations with you. Because we want to make sure that as we're serving these young kids, as we're serving middle schoolers and high schoolers, as we're creating environments for people to grow, that we have a standard that we, we want people to live by. And so you can come for as long as you want, and you, you can live the life that you live and live in that sin however you want. But once you say, you know what, I want to be put in, coach. Let me help. I want to be a part of the church. That's when we're going to say, hey, we want you. Now, here's some things that we require of you. And we call it a covenant. And it's nothing outside of the scripture. We want you to live life according to how Jesus has called us all to live as Christians. And so we're just saying, we want you to serve with us. Just do this and you're good and we're good. And by the way, we don't all fulfill it perfectly. But you know what happens if something on that little list that you sign and say, I'm going to do that. You know what happens if you break one of them? We fire you and you're never allowed back. No, that's everywhere else. I shouldn't have said that. Gosh, that's not everywhere else. You know what it means for us? It means that we will sit down and have a conversation and say, why are you hurting? This looks like something really, really bad's going on in your life. How can we help you get through that? You had an affair. You can't serve in our children's environments if you're sleeping with somebody else and you're married to another person. You can't serve in, but hey, it happened. I get it. Let's take you out of the environment and just so you have time to heal and let's talk about what to get you through this and restore your marriage. And then when your marriage is restored, guess what? There is a room waiting for you. But we have high expectations, and we will provide a place of restoration and healing. We will not judge you and kick you out. That's not what we do here. We want to love and provide a place for everybody to serve. So that's kind of what we got going on, our reputation. All right, let's go on. So verse, verse 9, For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. This is Paul talking about, I pray for you constantly, and there are things that I pray for you. He goes on. Always in my prayers, I'm making requests, if perhaps now, at last, finally, by the will of God, I may succeed and come to you. Paul never got to visit the church at Rome. He went to Rome, but he went there to be in prison and, and, to, and to be killed. He didn't actually ever get to visit these people that he'd been loving, praying, and, and being a part of. And I get the honor and privilege of getting to serve with you and be with you. And it is the highlight. Of my, I love being with you. I love serving with you. I love talking with you. I love spending time with you. I love hearing your stories of what God is doing in your life. You see, he didn't just thank God for them. He prayed relentlessly for them. He prayed specific things for them. And so I want to share with you a few things that I pray for you about. Now, I don't know if you know, but I pray for you every, every morning. I have an alarm that goes off at 7 a.m. on my phone, and it, and it says prayer. And, and, and I'm praying. That's, that's my time to pray. Now, I'll be honest. It may be more like 7.49 before I get to it, okay? But I am praying, okay? I'm praying for you, praying for my family, my life. I'm praying for our staff. And by the way, your staff prays for you. We meet every week. We pray for this church. We pray for you. If you're hurting, we know and we're praying. That prayer board that's out there, it is not just something with pieces of paper stuck to wood. We care about it. We, we pray for you. If you put it on that board, you are being prayed for. But I wanted to share with you three things that I'm praying specifically for you. Number one. I am praying that your identity in Christ precedes your activity for Christ. My heart is that you will see that, that your identity in Christ precedes and comes before any positive activity you do for Christ. That your identity is more important than your obedience. Okay? Now listen to me. This is what I mean. In the Old Testament, you had the nation of Israel who was born out of, the, out of Abraham and out of his seed, and they grew. And then all of a sudden, they're under the, the thumb of Egypt and Pharaoh. And then God sends Moses and delivers them out of that. And then Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, and there he gets these two tablets. We call them the, thank you, the Ten Commandments. Before Moses ever went up on that mountain, God looked at those people and said, You are my people, and I am your God. Before there were rules to follow, before there was obedience to be made, before he ever set the ground rules, he said... You're my people and I'm your God. He already gave them identity before he ever asked them to do anything. 
Because he already knew that whatever they tried to do, it would never be good enough to, to start that relationship. So he took the initiative and said, we already have a relationship. You can't earn your way into my good graces. I already love you. Now, here are some rules to help us grow in that and, by the way, to protect you, to provide you as a nation that will survive and thrive. Because if you don't keep these rules, you're going to die. You won't be able to make it in this world. And so it was for the protection of them a lot of times. Then you step into the New Testament, and Jesus looks at a group of guys. Guys, by the way, who were not smart enough to make it into the realm of you know, being a, a uh, either a Pharisee or a rabbi themselves. These, are, these, these guys were kind of the B team, the nobodies. They're fishing. That means they didn't make it in the, in the intellectual world, okay? They didn't have it all together. They, didn't, they weren't the cream of the crop or the best of the best. They were the guys who just did what, look, what, what you and I do. We just go and we do the things that we know how to do. And Jesus looks at him and says, hey, Matthew, follow me. Well, hold on. I'm a tax collector. I'm a sinner beneath sinners. Like I am the lowest of the low. Jesus says, that don't matter to me. Just come hang out with me for a while. Simon. Come follow me. Hold on. I'm a zealot. I'm a religious terrorist. I know that. I'm not asking you to change the way you think or do right now. Just come hang out with me for a while. And over time, you probably will. And he's every single one of the disciples, fishermen, like, come on. What, what do they have to offer? What, he, he, you must have. Peter must have been like, I can't do anything. There's, I, I, I mean, this is all I can do. And Jesus is like, perfect. You don't know what I know. You can't do what I do. Come follow me. And I'm, I promise you, we're already in relationship. You're already mine. I have already thought about you at your worst, and I chose to die for you anyway. Before you ever did anything good, before you ever did anything righteous, you're mine. Now, let's talk about what that relationship looks like. And that's how it begins, which is why it's so important to get this in your, in your heart, that your identity in Christ precedes your activity for Christ. By the way, your identity is in Christ. He's the one who gets to determine who you are and whose you are. You don't let the world do it. Don't let church do it. Hear me. Church will tell you that you're condemned. Church will tell you that your sin defines you. Your culture will tell you that your divorce is who you're identified with. Culture will tell you that your gender identifies you. Your sexuality identifies you. The abortion you had identifies you. The separation that you had identifies you. The fact that your kids you know, are unruly and don't listen to you, that identifies you. And what ends up happening is your biggest failure becomes a thing that ident identifies you. And you're like, well, of course, it's the biggest thing in my life. No, it's not. The biggest thing in your life is a Savior who died for you. That's the biggest thing in your life, and that's what identifies you. Not your biggest failure. So don't let the word, don't let anybody else tell you who you are. You belong to him. Even before you do anything that makes it worthy. That's why it's called grace. You didn't deserve it. He did it anyway. The second thing I pray for you is that you know and live out a surrendered life to Jesus. That you know and live out a life surrendered to Jesus. <clears throat> There's this um, verse in Galatians. Let me turn to it real quick. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. And this is Paul writing and he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul says, I'm going to live a life crucified to myself. I'm surrendering all I am to him. And listen to me, listen. Everything in this world is trying to get you to surrender to it. Everything else besides Jesus, everything else is trying to get you. Your finances, let me tell you something. There is, the, there is no greater happiness for the big banks of this world than for Citibank and Discover and Visa and MasterCard and American Express and Ashley Furniture to own your heart. They want to make sure that the first thing you do with your money is give it to them. They, they, don't, they don't care about you. You know, as, as um, y'all help me out. What's the guy's name that does the, come on, this is the financial church guy. Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey says, the furniture in their offices are better than what's in your house. Okay? And there's a reason for that. They have no problem making sure that the first thing you do with the things that you worked hard for goes away to somebody else. Man alive, we are servants, slaves, surrendered to them financially. What about your time? You're like, man, I really wish I could go to church or be a part of that group, or I wish I could go to that on Sunday, but I can't because I already have to do this. What is that? And is that worth it? Whatever that is, is it that which you are surrendering your time to, which is valuable? You have a very limited amount, by the way. Are you spending it the way your heavenly father who died for you would want you to spend that time? Is it actually put forth in something of value? Or are you just here checking off a box? Well, I did that on Sunday. Help the big man upstairs is paying attention. <laughs> you think that's why he died? You think he died for that? 
That's like spitting in his face, ain't it? So a life surrendered to Jesus means every area of your life. Every area of your life. Your talent. Oh my gosh, there is something about you that no one else can do. You have a gift, you have something that you're pouring out and you're giving it to something or someone else. By the way, it's probably someone or something else that's not going to be here very much longer. And whatever you're using your talent in in the professional world, someone else is going to take your spot and probably do it better than you. Same thing right here. Someone else is going to be right up here preaching and doing it better than me. The question is, are we using our talents for something that is worth it? Are we surrendering that part of our life to Jesus and, and impacting someone at an eternal value? Not just for the next two months or three months or five years. But, but that thing that transfers them over from sin and hell and death to life and beauty and resurrection and hope. How are we using our time, treasure, and talents? Is your life surrendered to Jesus? So that's my prayer. Know and live out a life surrendered to Jesus in every area of your life. The third thing, the third thing I pray is that you would see church as a family, not a facility. Church is a family. It's not a facility. It isn't carpet and concrete. It's people. It's broken people. People who realize that without Christ, they got nothing. People who realize that they ain't figured it out yet, but I want to. People who realize that, man, I'm in the middle of something and I don't even know how to get out of it. Would you help me? People who are healthy, people who are unhealthy, people who think they've got it figured out. And man, on, on Facebook, the highlight reel, it looks amazing, but inside they're falling apart and they don't know where to go or what to say or what to do. Churches supposed to be a family. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7, we get this description. John says about church, and, he, and he, ta- he used the word beloved because he's talking about the church. Beloved church, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Primarily, we, we're supposed to be people who love one another, help one another get through things. When you first decide to take a step of faith and follow Jesus, I don't know if you know this, but a big target is put on your back. And the scripture tells us that there is a lion, the enemy. And I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't, I've never really literally seen a lion. I've never literally seen the enemy or the devil. But man, I know what attack feels like. I know what darkness feels like. I know what it feels like when something comes after me or comes after my family. And when you decide to take a step of faith, a target is put on your back. And the scripture tells us that there is, the enemy is like a lion and he's ravenous with hunger. And do you know who he's going to pick off? He's going to pick off the sheep that's on the outside on the fringes who hasn't quite made up their mind yet about what they want to do or how much I want to get involved or I'm going to go one Sunday every six or, you know, it's just, I'm just kind of out here on the fringes and all of a sudden attack is coming, attack is coming. You're like, man, church ain't doing any good for me. Well, it's probably because you're on the outside and you're not smack dab in the middle of the herd where you can be protected from the enemy who's coming after you. You need to get involved because church is a family. We stand up for each other. We look out for each other. We pray for one another. Listen, how awesome is it to know that if you're in a small group, you're in a group with a group of people, that you're allowed to go that last 10% with? A lot of guys, women are different. Women are very open, and that's cool, and I'm a little jealous. But guys, they're willing to give 90%, and they feel like, ah, you know, if I tell most of the truth, ladies, can I get a witness? No? All right. We'll tell most of the truth, hoping that that'll be enough to get us by, but we'll reserve back just a little bit for me, right? That last 10%. Do you know that if you're in a small group, we hope to create a space where you can give out that last 10% and know that when you're struggling and you share that with another man in your group, you're going to know that that man loves you and is praying for you. He's not judging you. He's not talking about you behind your back, but he is being there to uplift you, to encourage you, to carry that burden, to slap on that 500-pound gorilla and say, let's do this together until we conquer this thing. Your church is a family. It's not a building. It's not a facility. So you need to get involved. You need to be a part of the church. You need to get involved in what we're doing. A lot of times I'll say that and I'll say, it doesn't matter where you serve. It doesn't matter where you give. It doesn't matter where you go. That's true. But listen, you're here. Jump in here. I mean, if you're here, it's probably because you think, man, I really love this, or this is being very, very helpful to me, or my kids like it, or whatever. Get involved. Serve. We need you. You need it more than we need you, honestly. We need you, but man alive, when you step over and you start serving, something happens on the inside of you because you realize, I can't do this, and then Jesus intercedes, and all of a sudden, a kid who you would never talk to a nine-year-old. You don't even know how to do that, and then all of a sudden, you're in a group of nine-year-olds, and one of them looks at you and says, hey, I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. Can you help me? And you're like, oh, my word. I had no idea you were even listening. I didn't even know you were paying attention. 
But when you get involved, something happens. Something changes. You need to serve. You need to give. You need, to, you need to have a plan for funding your local church. If this church is doing anything for you, find a way to fund it. If it's a dollar a month, you need to be doing something. Not because we need your money. It's because your heart is directly connected to your money. That's why you check your retirement fund every minute. Because your heart is like, whoa, you know, what's going on here? Listen. Listen to me. This isn't about your money. It's about your heart. You need to give, it, give some of it away. Be generous. So you need to get in a group. Okay, Church is a family. Not a facility. You need to get in a group. You need to be in a, around people who love you and care for you and are going to be there to protect you when the wolf, when the wolf, ha, when the lion comes. All right, verse 11 and 12. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. And here he's talking about him giving to them and them giving back to him. I, I long to see you so that I can give some of me over to you so that you may be established. And then he goes on. That is that I may also be encouraged with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine, that we're here to pour into each other. We're here to do things together. In other words, we are here. We exist. This whole thing is here. Bamer Church exists. We're here to do church with you, not for you. Now, you can come for a while and do this, okay? You can come for a while and be like, listen, I just need to be poured into. I just need love. We created this place for you. You need to experience that. But there will come a time where someone will look you in the eye and say, all right, buddy, it's time to step up. We're going to do church together, not just for you anymore. It's time to take that next step. It's time to be bold. By the way, if I see you in Walmart and you say, um, hey, I go to your church, I get it. I, I appreciate that. But it's not my church. So if you see me in Walmart, say, hey, we go to church together. That would be awesome because that's the truth. We go to church together. This ain't my church. You don't go to my church. And one day I, this, I won't be here anymore. It's going to be somebody else up here. So it's not my church. We do church together. We do church with each other because in so doing, it is this beautiful relationship where we pour into one another. And I get encouraged so much by you. I get to hear your stories of being, I've been in groups with a lot of you, and I get to hear how you went through something I've never been through, and your faith blows my mind. And when I come into a place of doubt, I just think, oh my, how did they get through that? If they can get through that, I, I can get through this. I can, I can keep pushing. I can keep going because of what I've seen them get through. Your faith encourages me and keeps me going when I want to quit, when I want to give up. We're here to build each other up and do church with each other not for each other verse 13 <clears throat> i do not want you to be unaware brethren that often i plan to come to you and have been prevented so far so that i may obtain some fruit so that i will be able to use my gift and see something happen so that we'll see the work of god happen in and amongst us that we'll see people come to know jesus as their lord and savior that the fruit of us you know doing what we do will come about and we'll be able to see something amazing happen. So if I can push a little bit more, let's talk about serving one more time. Serving in a local church is the second most important thing you will ever do in your life. It is the second most important thing. you. The first thing is, is serving your family, okay? Taking care of your family. That's first. That's priority. I get it. And I'm not talking about, okay, level of importance is God, then family, then church. I get all that. I'm talking about where is your time going? Like, who is getting that? Where are you putting forth the effort? And your first priority in time and service and all that stuff needs to be your family. But listen, the local church, it was there for you, wasn't it? The only reason we're able to be here is because there was a group of people who were here eight years ago, some of which, a lot of which, aren't even here anymore. But they put forth a lot of faith and a lot of finances and a lot of serving and a lot of time to create a space for you to experience what you've experienced in the last three weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, one year. So how are you getting involved? Because, listen, you can do other things through the time. I get it. I know. But here's the thing. Everything you do with your time other than being a part of what God is doing in the local church, it's all temporary. Every bit of it. Even healing somebody. You ever think about it? every Doctors and nurses, amazing. My wife's a nurse. Love you guys. You guys fulfill scripture. You guys are an answer to prayer. People pray, God, would you bring me healing? And all of a sudden, a doctor walks in and says, I know how to fix that. That is a miracle. That is an answer to prayer. But you need to know that every bit of that, no matter where you're at on the spectrum, it's all temporary. The only thing that lasts forever is when you help someone transfer from darkness to light. When you share the gospel with them and they go from a non-believer to a believer. That is why serving in a local church is so important. It is the second most important thing you do in your life because what happens lasts forever. It's not temporary. I'm going to throw this next phrase up here and judge me if you want. You cannot be in God's will and not serving God's people at the same time. I don't think it's possible. 
I think that in order to be in the middle of God's will, if you're going to call yourself a Christian and live according to his purpose, you have to be amongst his people. We're commanded not to forsake the gathering of one another. We're commanded to lift each other up and bear one another's burdens. We're commanded to one another, one another. And you can't one another, one another if you're sitting at your house doing nothing. you got to be a part of the local community. And so if you're wondering, man, I just ain't felt God in a while. I just don't know what's going on in my life. I feel like I'm disconnected. Well, how disconnected are you? What are you doing in the local church? Are you a part of his body? Or were you a part of his body? And then you cut off that arm and now it's sitting in your house and it's starting to smell because it's disconnected from the body. No blood, no oxygen, nothing going on. And and, and your life feels like that. Your life feels like you're disconnected and and you start your life's starting to stink a little bit. It might be because you're not connected to the body anymore. It's time to get reconnected. <clears throat> Verse 14. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. This is Paul saying, my heart is for everybody. The Greeks means local. The barbarians means foreigners. Now, I know we hear barbarians. We think ooga booga, right? We think like, oh, whatever. That's not what he's talking about, okay? He's talking about local people and foreigners. Paul's like, listen, I'm obligated to everyone here. I'm obligated to people who aren't here. I'm obligated both to the wise and to the foolish. I'm obligated to the people who know, and I'm obligated to the people who don't know. You know what this looks like here? I'm obligated to preach in such a way that the people who've been Christians for 20 years learn something. But I'm also obligated to preach and talk and teach in such a way that if you've never even heard the name Jesus before, you'll be able to do something with whatever you heard before you leave. And we're obligated both to the local people and to the foreigners. That everything we do here is designed... To reach people who aren't in the seats yet. And I I cannot overemphasize how passionate I am about this. That everything we do in this church, we, 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 we do uncomfortable ministry. In fact, we do messy ministry. Because we'll let anybody in here. We'll let broken people, sinful people, people caught right up in the middle of something. People who are going through something they've never been through before. People who have been abused. People who are abusing. We, we, we want everybody in this room because we think this is the best place for them to be. And it's messy. You want to know what, what, what um, comfortable church looks like? Comfortable church looks like everybody in the same tax bracket, dressing the same, and they all are the same color, and they all go to the same church, and they all talk about the same things, and they all have one thing in common. That's comfortable church, and I don't think it's, I don't think it's Jesus' church, to be honest with you. Jesus was surrounded by broken, messed up people. He was surrounded by religious zealots who who were terrorists. He was surrounded by unintelligent people. He was surrounded by intelligent people. He was surrounded by people who were of Judaism. He was was surrounded by people who weren't Jewish. He was surrounded by people who were pagan worshipers. He was surrounded by the most elite in the community. It was a hodgepodge of people who just recognized one thing. I'm broken and I need you. doesn't matter anything else. It's irrelevant. And so if you come to church here, it's going to be messy and it will be uncomfortable. But you need to know I am really, really comfortable with it being uncomfortable. And so if you want to come to me and have a conversation about it, just know I'm really comfortable with how uncomfortable you're going to feel. Because I think that's what church is. It's supposed to be messed up people who are in the middle of the worst things. And the hope, the hope, the prayer, my prayer is that, yes, you can come in all of that, but that you won't stay there. That will create a space where you feel, where you feel okay enough to let go, to live to live a life and you're clenched all the time because you're so shameful and you're so scared and you're so hurt that if you could come here long enough, maybe you'll open up your hands and we can bless you again. And then one day you'll be a blessing to someone else because your hands are open enough to be able to pour your life into another person. But it's messy when you do that, when you create a place like that. We can create a lot of rules and kick people out because they don't do what we do. That's not church. So I'll say it this way. If we ever get too comfortable, we're probably doing it wrong. So I hope we, we get uncomfortable and we stay uncomfortable. Verse 15. So, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And Paul's just saying, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to preach the gospel. Let me finish with this thought that I wrote down. And then, and then I'm going to tell you some things that I'm thankful for for you. We will preach the gospel. It is totally and only and always about Jesus. He is the answer to the question. He is the reason for believing in anything and trusting in anyone. He is the only one true hope left to us. He is the only person that will never fail you, never forsake you, never leave you hopeless or helpless. He will sustain you and protect you. He will teach you and rebuke you. He will encourage you and uplift you. He will give you substance when everything else seems fake and plastic. 
He is the only real thing to you. He is the same no matter your vision. He's speaking no matter your hearing. He will touch you despite your filth. He is worth tasting for he is good. There is no place you can go you can hide from him. There is nothing, no situation you'll face where you don't need him. He is the light of life. He is your salvation. He is your beginning and your end. He is all that you will ever need. And we will never stop talking about that Jesus. Now, I want to tell you a couple of things that I'm thankful for as your pastor. Number one, thank you. I am so thankful to you because your generosity paved the way for people to get to know Christ. Over the last eight years, we've seen dozens and dozens and dozens of people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And it's because you look at this place and you say, I'm not writing this check to keep the lights on. I'm going to give because I know that it's going to make a difference in someone's eternity. So thank you. Thank you for believing in something even if you never saw the fruit of it. Thank you for your generosity. Number two, thank you for allowing God to work in you. I, I, see, it, I see it all the time. When, we, when you walk in, I don't know if you've noticed, but we did a sermon series here a while back about the, the, your heart's condition, the soul, and, and, and how your, the soil of your heart, is, is it ready to receive whatever God has for you? And I use these jars, and I put the jars back there. And I haven't said this out loud, but the hope is that as you're walking into the auditorium, you look at those four jars and one's empty and one's got rocks in it, one's got thorns in it, and one's good soil with a, with a beautiful flower growing in it. My hope is that as you walk through, you think, where's my heart at? Is it that healthy soil? And that, and that if it isn't, that you'll, you'll take a moment before the service and get your heart right. And I have seen you do this over and over again. And I've watched you desire to know God and to see him do something in you. So thank you, thank you, thank you that you allow God to work in you, through you, and to you. As you serve, as you do what you do. Thank you for allowing me to be your pastor. Thank you for letting me try things that were dumb for... For, for not having the faith that you've had. Listen to me. When we first started this thing, we were a video church, and I'm like, I, I had another church before here, and I just preached, and you know, I knew how to do that. I didn't know how to start a church in, in Bainbridge, Georgia, first of all, which is difficult, and I didn't know how to start a church that was video-based, and I didn't know what any of that looked like, and, and, but you guys came, and you guys trusted, and you were part of what we were doing, and you're like, you know what? I don't, I don't really understand it all, but, I, but something's got me to keep coming back, and you kept coming, and you kept coming, and you allowed me to do dumb things, and you, you allowed me to try things, and Oh my word, you gave me so much grace. You had more faith than I had. There were times when I wanted to bail and some of you looked at me and were like, no, God's going to do something. Keep going, keep going. Thank you for giving me grace and allowing me to make mistakes. And by the way, I'm not done making mistakes. So keep them, keep the grace coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the good soil that you bring to the gathering every week. I mean, I come after you sometimes, pretty hard, but, you, but you're so, so generous, and you're like, listen, I needed that, I needed that, where it pains me to even talk about some of this stuff, but it's stuff that I preach to me first, long before it ever hits you, it's going through my heart, but you, you, thank you for bringing good soil, thank you for the environments that you create, this is a hospital for the sick, can you make people feel welcome, thank you, thank you, thank you for that, thank you for your willingness to risk big for the glory of God, I mean, some of you, it's cost you a job to be going here, some of you, it cost you friends, some of you, it's cost you financially. But you're like, you know what? I'm in. I believe that God's doing something amazing, and I'm going to be a part of what he's doing. Thank you for being an example to me of what it looks like to give sacrificially and to do sacrificially for something you believe in. And then lastly, my wife and I thank you. April and I thank you for creating a place that we can raise our kids in. Thank you for creating a place through your financial giving, through, through your service, that you created Woombaland. And my kids went through Woombaland. And my kids went through Upstreet. And my kids went through Youth Group. Thank you for creating a place that set an anchor in their heart. And as they hit things that were difficult, and, and, and they didn't want to come to me because, you know, I'm daddy. Who's going to come? When I need to talk to somebody, I'm going to talk to somebody else. And thank you for not coming to me and telling me what my kid was struggling with. Thank you. And thank you for telling them what I would have told them if they would have come to me. You have no idea how important this is to me. My wife and I are thoroughly satisfied customers of this church. Because of you, because of what you do. Because of your love for people. Because you know that this is real and that life hurts and that Jesus is the answer. And you're willing to tell people and teach people and spend time with kids and love on them. 
So thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of getting to be here and stand in this position and to serve with these amazing people. And thank you that this is your church and you promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so we can't fail as long as, as long as you're first, as long as you're the number one thing, as long as we keep you lifted high, you promise to draw all men unto yourself. And we're going to keep doing that. And we're going to mess up sometimes. And so I thank you for grace. But thank you. Thank you for who you are. And thank you for what you're doing in and through each and every one of us. I love you and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you guys need prayer, if you want to talk about serving, if you want to talk about giving, I'll be right back there and I'll help you with any of that. Chad's going to kind of wrap us up, but if you need anything, come find me. I'll be right over there. Yes. Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, so two things. One, uh, maybe this is your first time. Maybe you're watching online for the first time. Uh, we're so glad that you guys came. Um, I would suggest if you're trying out a church or this church right now, just stick around for this series. Right, laddie? Just stick around for this series, and eight, eight or nine months we'll be done with it, okay? And then you can, you'll, you can decide. Uh, no, youth, youth, youth. I'm talking about youth. I'm talking about middle school and high schoolers. Uh, we meet every Wednesday at 6.30 in the youth building. We've been leaving and going for supper. This week will change, okay? We're going to try something different. You're still going to meet at 6.30, but you're not going to pick them up from a restaurant. You're going to pick them up from there at 8.30, 6.30 to 8.30, we will not leave. We'll be in the student building the whole time. We're going to be uh, cooking some tacos. Who loves tacos? Everybody else is liars. Come on now. You know you like tacos. <laughs> uh, we're going to be trying to meal together, trying to do some different things. So uh, make sure you're here. Uh, if you want to try out for the band as far as the youth, we're going to practice at 545. And then youth will be from 630 to 830. If you're a middle schooler or a high schooler, I hope to see you there. If you know a middle schooler or a high schooler, put them in your van and bring them in here and drop them off. Okay? All hearts good? There's one. That's good enough. Hey, love you guys. Uh, we'll see you next week. Okay?